Okay, in this video, I wanna teach you two valid argument forms, two implication rules or rules of logic that we're gonna use a lot in this class. And those rules are modus ponens and modus tollens. They aren't the only valid argument forms, not by a long shot, but they are very common. And they are going to provide you with a helpful pattern or template for constructing your own arguments or for reconstructing the arguments of other philosophers. Now, in order to understand the implication rules, you have to learn just a couple of symbols that are used in propositional logic. We're gonna learn the tilde, that's the sideways squiggly sign, and the horseshoe, which can also be represented as a, an arrow that points from left to right. The tilde means that whatever comes in front of it is not the case. And so it, it's a symbol for not, it's a symbol for negation. And the arrow or the horseshoe is a symbol for a conditional relationship, an if-then relationship. So what goes, the statement that goes on the left-hand side of the horseshoe is the if statement, the antecedent. And the statement that goes on the right-hand side of the horseshoe is the then statement or the consequent. Now, when we symbolize statements in logic, each simple statement is represented by a capital letter, and it's arbitrary which capital letter you choose. So here's how this works. Let's say I want to symbolize the statement, Socrates is a man. I can just pick the letter M to represent that whole statement and say M, M means Socrates is a man. And I can use the letter U to symbolize the statement, Socrates is a unicorn. So then if I wanted to say Socrates is not a unicorn, I would say tilde U. The tilde means it is not the case that. And then what goes in front of it is Socrates is a unicorn. If I wanted to symbolize the conditional statement, if Socrates is a man, then he is a unicorn. I would symbolize that M arrow U, because M means Socrates is a man. The arrow means if then, so it's like if he's a man, then U is a unicorn. And then of course I can use the tilde to negate either one of those. So I can say if Socrates is a man and he's not a unicorn, that would be M arrow tilde U. I'm only teaching you this not because I'm going to make you symbolize things, but because it's going to help you to understand the basic structure of these two rules that I want to teach you. Now, both of these rules involve conditional statements. They both involve if-then premises. So let me just say a couple things about conditional statements. When we talk about conditionals, the statement that follows the word if is called the antecedent of the conditional statement. The statement that follows the word then is called the consequent of the antecedent. And that holds true in whatever order they appear in the natural language sentence. So for example, uh, if we've got the sentence, if Socrates is a man, then he is a unicorn, we're gonna represent that as M arrow U. M stands for Socrates is a man. Uh, Socrates, U stands for Socrates is a unicorn, so it's going to be M arrow U. But let's say we ran into a natural language sentence that reversed that order. It says Socrates is a unicorn if he is a man. Well, guess what? We're going to symbolize that the same way because the if the statement that follows the if is still the antecedent. So we're going to put that first on the left hand side of the arrow. And then we're going to put the arrow, and then we're going to put, put the consequent, Socrates is a unicorn. It's going to go on the right-hand side of the arrow, even though it came first in the sentence. Because what we're symbolizing is the logical structure of the sentence, not even just the exact word order. That'll be helpful to you as you think about uh, the logic of arguments that are presented to you in natural language text. But so far, that's just terminology about here's what conditional statements are, here's how we represent them structurally. Now let me teach you the rule modus ponens. 
Here it is. It's in this yellow box. Modus ponens is an argument form in which one of the premises is a conditional statement. So if P, then Q, where P can be any statement you want and Q can be any statement you want. So that's one of the premises. Another premise is, one of the, another premise is gonna be just P, okay? And then there's this line, this line just means therefore, what goes underneath that line is the conclusion. So if you've got a premise that says if P then Q, and you've got another premise that says P, you can validly conclude that Q is true. Um, let me give you an example that'll make it more concrete. Let's say that um, we've got the sentence, if it's raining, then the streets are wet. It's raining is like our P in this case. The streets are wet is the Q. We've got another premise that says it is raining. In other words, P is true. We can validly infer that Q is true. That is that the streets are wet. If it's raining and the streets are wet, it is raining. Therefore, the streets must be wet. If those premises are true, and they might not be, but if they are, that conclusion necessarily follows. Now, don't get that confused with um, a fallacy. This is a bad argument that's not valid, that looks a lot like modus ponens, but it's not. It starts the same way, if P then Q. But then there's a different premise. Instead of the other premise being P, the antecedent, it's Q, the consequence. So it says, and then it, it, it concludes that the antecedent must be true, P. Let me give you the concrete version of that. If it's raining, then the streets are wet. The streets are wet, therefore it's raining. But that's not valid. Can you imagine, can you conceive of any situation in which it's true that if it were raining, the streets would be wet? And where it's true that the streets are wet, and yet it's false that it's raining. Can you conceive of any such scenario? Yes, you can. Maybe it was raining 10 minutes ago and the streets are still wet. In that case, the premises are true, but the conclusion is false because it stopped raining. Or maybe somebody hosed down the sidewalk, it does, it hosed down the streets. The point is these premises do not necessitate their conclusion. That's called the fallacy of affirming the consequence. All right, let's look at a couple other natural language examples of this. Here's a, an example of a modus ponens argument. If drivers on cell phones have more accidents, then drivers should be prohibited from using them. It's an if P then Q. If we make P stand for drivers on cell phones have more accidents, and Q stands for drivers should be prohibited from using cell phones. That first premise is our conditional statement, if P then Q. Second premise, drivers on cell phones do have more accidents. The antecedent is true. Therefore, the consequent is true. Drivers should be prohibited from using cell phones. Now, regardless of whether these premises are actually true or not, the argument is valid logically. Any argument that has this form is valid logically. Even if it's not sound, it's at least valid. Another example, here's a moral example. If an action promotes the best interests of everyone concerned and it violates no one's rights, then that action is morally acceptable. Well, in at least some cases, active euthanasia promotes the best interests of everyone concerned and violates no one's rights. Therefore, in at least some cases, it's morally acceptable. Now, to see that this structure is basically a modus ponens, Think of it this way, P in this case is an action promotes the best interests of everyone concerned and it violates no one's rights. Q is an action is morally acceptable. And so the structure here is first premise again is it's conditional. Second premise is uh, the antecedent and the conclusion is the consequent. I could tidy it up a little bit by spelling out the active euthanasia part in the first premise, but I thought I was making more clunky. Now, modus ponens is really useful because you can do a magic trick with it, okay? 
you can turn any two statements into a valid instance of modus ponens if you just add in a conditional statement that joins them together. This is gonna be very useful to you as you try to construct your own arguments and as you try to formalize the arguments that other people make. So for example, let's say uh, you get somebody, a friend says this to you, today is Friday, so I will win the lottery. Now look, as it stands, this argument is not valid. You've got one premise, today is Friday. You've got a conclusion, I will win the lottery. Now, can you conceive of today being Friday and yet you not winning the lottery? Sure you can, it's happened to many of us. Um, however, let's say we interpret our friend charitably and think, you know, they, they just, because we were speaking informally, they left out a crucial premise, but what they intended it, and here's what the premise would be that would make this argument valid. You know what the premise is? Um, well, it would be a conditional statement that turned, uh, that, that joined these two simple statements together. That statement would be, if today is Friday, then I will win the lottery. Now, if you've got one premise that says, if today's Friday, then I will win the lottery. And you've got another premise that says that antecedent is true, today is Friday, then it follows validly that I will win the lottery. The argument is perfectly valid now. It's not sound, of course, because that second premise that we invented is false. It, it's not true that if today is Friday, you're gonna win the lottery. But if, if it were true, this would be a valid argument. Now, I want you to try to do this. Do it yourself, come up with the magic trick, the, that conditional premise that will make this a valid argument. So one pre the premise here is Vladimir Putin worked for the CIA. Therefore, the moon is made out of green cheese. What premise do you need that would turn that into a valid argument? That's right. If Putin worked for the CIA, then the moon is made out of green cheese. Do you add that premise in? That is a valid, not a sound argument. Now, uh, let's talk about modus uh, let's talk about modus tollens in our in our next video. I just want to start here. Uh, modus ponens is quite enough just for this one. We'll come back to this in a moment.